how have you managed to keep such a youngish poster for so many years? I was looking at the Kumi Preku videos, and you have not changed even from then. I mean, I saw Nanako Fado, we showed this video, we showed it again, he's changed, now Tamaklo, all the guys. How come that you have not changed? What have you been doing? Well, first of all, I don't know if I haven't changed. No, you haven't. I'll, I'll, I'll put a photograph up now. People will see that you haven't. You I haven't look as changed young as. Yes, okay. So, this is it. So, so, Chrissy, tell us who are in this photograph? Some we can easily identify, some we, we don't know. Who are these? Well, I think everybody can be easily identified. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the guys who are sitting down mm -hmm. from the left, is my good friend uh, Akutu Ampao. Yeah. And then there is His Excellency the President Nanado Dankwa Akufuado, mm -hmm. and uh, Tazan, Dr. Charles Reku Robby. Yeah. There is uh, Kweku Baku Kakraba, now Abdul Malik Kweku Baku, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklo. Mm -hmm. And then from the back is uh, Kweku Poku. Oh, that's Kweku Poku. Okay. Yeah, Kweku Poku, and. Uh, your, your good self. Yeah. And then? and then Kakrawa Cromwell, who okay. I think used to be the president of the National Union of Ghana Students. Yeah. And Victor Newman, okay. who is now, I think, the head of research. Yeah, the director the of research. At the Flagstaff House. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what occasion was this? Well, I think that this must have been about after the first demonstration in Accra, the, mm -hmm. the Kumi Preku demonstration. And after, you know, we had lost some of our people. They were killed. And others, yeah, they were killed in the demonstration. And uh, we decided to organize a funeral for them. And somebody suggested that we needed to take this photograph. Indeed, that person turned out to be quite prophetic because the person said that this photograph will become part of our history. And so oh, I see. And today I see this photograph being circulated everywhere. Hmm. So, so why did you take this photograph? Where? This photograph was taken at the, at the home of uh, Dr. Charles Rekubrobe in his garden, you know. Ah, I see. So this was the home of Dr. Charles Rekubrobe. I think it was in North Ridge. Yeah. North Ridge. Yeah. You know, yeah. But why are you not in the black cloth? Because I didn't have a black cloth. You didn't have one? I didn't have one. <laughs> so the, the nearest you could get was something that has whitish in it for a funeral? Well, it's dark, and mm. uh, for me it was sufficient. You know. mm, I see. Besides, uh, I'm not that traditional. Okay. If I had a black cloth, I would have worn it. This is all I had. There, uh, are there some other people who were leaders of the demonstration who are not in this photograph? Well, you know, it's about how we tell history. It's about how we relate to history. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, history is about the most known. History is about those who address press conferences and so on. Mm -hmm. And history tends to ignore the mass of people who really are the makers of history. Mm -hmm. So there are nine of us in this photograph, but there were many thousands who participated in the event, who did many things, uh, who contributed immensely to the success of our enterprise, who would never be known who would never be mentioned, and who had no opportunity to be in photographs like this. There's one who is very, very significant, and I refer to my good friend Stanley Ejiri Blankson. Stanley Blankson, the former mayor of Accra? Yeah, who is now a member of the Council of State. Yes. The whole idea of forming that alliance and of organizing... The Alliance for Change. The Alliance for Change. Mm -hmm and also of, of confronting the establishment at the time and so on, was actually nurtured in the J. Blankson's house. I see. And yet, for some strange reason, he never became one of the nine. Eventually, when we expanded the group, we brought him in. But this whole idea started from the house of a J. Blankson in Dansuma. I think it was uh, Nana Kufuado's birthday. So which would have been in March. Yeah, it was at Nana Akufuado's birthday. Mm -hmm. They had all gathered there. I wasn't there. I wasn't at the birthday. They had gathered in Adri Blankson's house on Akufuado's birthday. On Akufuado's birthday. Okay. And Why uh, you say they had all gathered? Who were these? At nine? Oh, friends of Nana Akufuado, okay. associates and so on, had mm -hmm. gathered at Adri Blankson's house. And in the course of the discussions, the idea 
of organizing a demonstration came up. But you said you were not there? I wasn't in that place. I wasn't okay. at that birthday party. Okay. You understand? So after the birthday party, I had a call for, from Ferdinand Ayim. Oh, the late Ferdinand. Ferdinand? The late Ferdinand Ayim. And he said to me that, look, we've been at Akufuado's party. These discussions are taking place and so on. And we think that we need to concretize it and so on. And that the meeting was being scheduled, I think, for the next day. You know, so my task from the conversations that I had with him was to bring on board people like me. I mean, obviously, we came from different backgrounds. We had different political persuasions and, and so on. And the idea was to have a broad-based movement. Mm -hmm. So we needed to bring many other people on board and so on. So I attended the meeting and I agreed to be part. Who were at this meeting when you attended? Where was it held? The meeting was held in Dr. Charles Rekubrobe's house. Mm -hmm. um, the nine of us were there. There were other people who were there. Uh, Ferdinand Ayim was there. There were a few other people who were there. Uh, you know, the problem is that I'm telling the story of 25 years ago. I understand, and everyone and appre I, I, appreciates <coughs> how much you can remember. <laughs> and I'm relying almost entirely on my memory. Yeah, yeah. I am not like Victor Newman and Kukuba who, who, who don't play with records and documents. <laughs> I, I hardly keep documents and so on. Okay. So I'm relying entirely on my memory. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other difficulty is simply that too many things happened at too many different places. And no one person, no one person can tell the whole story. Of Kumi Preku? Nobody. There's well, nobody. That's interesting. Well, for all events, for yeah. all the historical events, you can only tell a part of the story. And your angle, the angle. Because you can't be everywhere mm. at every time. But that means that many things were happening for Kumi Preku at different places oh, to bring course. it together. Of course. By I mean, different people. Every day. A thousand things were happening, more than a thousand things were happening every day. We were the core of the whole movement. I mean, the nine of us were the core of the whole movement. We were receiving reports from all over the country. We were discussing these reports and so on. Indeed, that was a period in my life when sometimes we met three times a day. I see. I mean, every morning before I went to work, you know, we would gather in an Akufa. What, what work were you doing at that time? Editor of the newspaper? Well, I've done many things. I've always done many things. Mm -hmm. Editing a newspaper, organizing agitations. Agitations? Of course. I've been all my life. I've been at the center of all kinds of agitations, mm -hmm. you know. So I wake up in the morning and drive straight to an Akufa house, and we would have breakfast, you know, in an Akufa house and discuss the program for the day. And then in the afternoon, we would meet in Charles Rekubrabi's house and have lunch and, and, and work around lunch and so on. It became like a routine, you know. And the evening, we would gather again and visit different people, different organizations and so on, convincing them to join us, discussing their difficulties and problems and so on. And then we may end up in a Jerry Blankson's house or places that he was associated with and have dinner, you know. So it was, it was rigorous. I mean, it was a 24-hour enterprise. You know, there was no rest for anybody. And uh, we worked so very hard, so very so hard. Towards May 11th. And all the other things that happened. But, but how did you choose May 11th? Was it spontaneous? Was it by calculation of the preparation of things you needed to do and all that? Well, somehow, I think there was a desire to create a myth. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we set out to create a myth. And if you watch, all the major events that we organized were organized on Thursdays. Okay, I have not noticed. No, so this was if, a if Thursday. You, if, you, if you check the dates. The dates, okay. Okay, so this was a Thursday. Yeah, but it, it, was, it was a deliberate effort to create a myth. Why would Thursdays be mythical? There was nothing superstitious about it, you know, but somehow we agreed that we would organize our events on, on Thursdays. Uh, it created a certain myth. And so, okay, yeah, okay. You know. yeah, so that every Thursday there was panic about what was going to happen. It didn't happen Thursday. every Thursday. I mean, sometimes there were intervals of two weeks and so on. Yeah, okay. But we made it a point 
to mm. organize the major events on, on Thursdays mm. and so on. So we had this first meeting, and the first meeting decided that we're going to organize this demonstration. We selected the team, which was uh, Kumi Prekum and so on. And to be honest with you, most of our statements were crafted by Dr. Charles Rekubrovi. When you say statements, what do you mean? Oh, press conference statements. Okay, okay, okay. So all right, all right, most yeah. of them were crafted yeah. by Dr. Charles. The public statements. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Charles Roku Brobe. Mm -hmm. Akutuampa also played a key role in putting together statements, you know, and so on. Akutuampa is perhaps, I've worked with many people, you know, I've come to respect many people. And I have no doubt at all that of the many people that I've worked with, Akutuampa is a super brain. Mm. You know, he's, he's, he's a super brain. I mean, his intellectual capacity is huge, you understand. So he helped in, in crafting most of those statements and so on. So crafting statements and so on was virtually between him and Dr. Reku mm. Dr. Reku was the work workhorse of the movement. I mean, he would work nonstop. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I was wondering whether he, he slept at all. You know, he was working all the time work, 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 you know, all the time. I mean, if you have an enterprise and you have somebody like Charles with you, you can rest. He would do the work and he did do the work, you know. There were some of us who also tried to work hard, you know, but we were more on the strategic side, you know, uh, trying to think through things, anticipating what was likely to happen, and developing strategies for overcoming the hurdles in our way and so on. And some of us also did the legwork work of moving from place to place, getting in touch with people and so on. Charles didn't do a lot of that. You know, Charles, he didn't move around that much? No. It was, it was Akotuampa who managed to combine real activism with his intellectual work. Mm -hmm. you know. What did Anakufado do? That's an interesting question. Um, I've heard many people describe him as the leader of the Alliance for Change. Maybe to some extent they're right. Okay. Because he eventually became the public face of the movement. Mm -hmm. But strictly speaking, we set out to build a strong collective. And we insisted on collective leadership. So nothing happened that did not involve everybody. Nothing happened that we all didn't agree on. Nobody gave instructions and so on. And you can talk to all of them and they would admit to this. Mm -hmm. Nana's role came up, and I mean the president, His yeah. Excellency Nana Dodankwa Kofuado, his name came up, when we had drafted the first statement which we were to use at the press conference. Mm -hmm. And then we asked ourselves, who amongst us was going to read that press statement? And I think it was Akutuampa and I who said that it has to be Nana Akufuado. And there was no objection, you know. And then the question came that yes, he's going to read the statement on our behalf, but in what capacity? Who would he be when he reads our statement and so on? And the suggestion came that we should describe him as the spokesperson. So throughout, Nana Kufuado was known as the spokesperson of the group. Of the Alliance for Change. Of the Alliance for Change. We didn't have a chairman. We mm -hmm. didn't have a secretary. We didn't have any position. The only position we had was the position of a spokesperson. And that was, was conferred on Nana Kufuado simply because he read the first statement at the first press conference. And Did he read subsequent statements then? So he became the face of it? Yeah, he became more or less the public face of, of the alliance, you know, and uh, it worked. What did Kweku Baku do, for instance? Kweku was more or less an activist, mm -hmm. a serious activist. I mean, even in those days, Kweku did provide us with historical material. Oh, I see. Yeah. Way back even then. No, Kweku has always been known for that. Anybody okay. who has worked with Kukubako cannot deny the fact that when it comes to our history, 
And when it comes to finding relevant materials mm -hmm. which confirm the facts of our history, and even sometimes the facts of our present and so on, he happens to be very good at that, and he played that role throughout. Indeed, all of us were involved in the general thinking who shaped things and so on. You know, after the Kumi Preku demonstration, when four people had been shot and so on, we all scouting around, looking for information and so on. And I can say with some certainty that Kweku played a lead role in that. We eventually came to identify the people who had done the shooting. Oh, I see. Yes, we knew The them. individuals who had shot the gun the that individuals killed. individuals who had fired the guns which had killed. Oh, I see. Uh, we came to identify the vehicles they had used. Uh, we came in possession of police, wireless messages, and so on. Whoa. You know, so we, we, we got a whole gamut of documents and so on. And uh, to a very large extent, Kuku was at the center of that, you know. So that's, that's the interesting. Against, that against the yeah. Rawlings presidency, you were able to get all that kind of information. That's, that's You can always get any information that you want in this country. I mean, there, there, there's no People don't know much about uh, Kweku Poku because he didn't sort of continue in the political discourse post-2000 and all that. So when I, I talk to people these days, they, they know Kweku Pratt, they know Kweku Bakun, they know Nanakufado, Dr. Brobe, he ran for elections and all that. And he still continued to be active in radio and television conversations about uh, freedom and all of that. Uh, Tony Akutuampa is known, Ajib Blankson. Who is Kweku Poku? What did he do and where is he? Well, Kweku Poku is an interesting chap. I mean, there were different personalities mm -hmm. in the alliance. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take somebody like Victor Newman, yeah. and I didn't hear or see Victor Newman mount a podium and make a speech. Mm -hmm. you know, Victor Newman was always a background person. You know, and Victor Newman, to some extent, is like Kukubaku. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people don't... In terms of being a repository of, of information. Yeah, well, Victor Newman is the one who is always in the background, who would always go and fish for documents, who would write you know, research material and pass it on and so on. And I'm not surprised that he has become the director of research in the Flagstaff House because he played that role even then. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would go around and find information and so on, never wanting to take credit for anything. Now, Kweku Poku was a very, very quiet gentleman. You know, perhaps one of the most gentle people amongst us. Very, very deep, you know, very, very deep person. But he also never played a frontline role. He preferred to be in the background, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and to tag along and so on. And in any serious movement, you need all of this, you know, to be able to move forward, to be able to make your impact, to be able to realize your objectives and so on. So that was Kweku Poku. What was his, what, what, what was his profession? What, was he a politician? Well, Kweku Poku, I don't know who you call a politician, <laughs> you understand? Mm. Uh -huh. I wouldn't call Kweku Poku a politician. I call Kweku Poku a citizen who feels very deeply about his country and wants to make a contribution. Was he a lawyer? No, Kweku Poku, as I knew him, was doubling in music. I mean, he plays the harmonica very well. Even oh, now, see. I've seen him at plus two, three. Oh, he's still around. Yeah. Let's have the photograph of the, uh, playing, of the playing, nine again and let's identify Kweku Poku. You know. So he doubles in yeah. music. Uh, so, he's, so he's the one uh, standing on top of Akutuan first from left, yeah, next to yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kweku Poku doubles in music, okay. he's an artist, you know, he, he's, 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 he works in that direction. Okay. You know, I think, I think if I'm right, I think at a certain point he also was a teacher. Okay. I think he worked in NAPTI. You know, as, as oh, so instructor. teaching in that area, I think teaching so. television I and, think and so. film and if that I'm kind not of thing. Mistaken. Okay, he's I, a creative I, hey, kind of guy. If, he's, well, creative. he's very creative. Okay, very okay. creative, and was was very key in the design of the posters that we used. Yeah. you know, and so on, all the artwork and so on. He was okay. very key in thinking through teams and so on. So what about everybody was useful. Kakraba Cromwell, tell us a bit more about him. <laughs> Kakaba Kuma was a student leader. From the University of Ghana? He was a student leader. I think he had been uh, president of the National Union of Ghana students. And uh, Kakaba Kuma came on board 
with some exuberance, which was needed at the time. Mm -hmm. He was very, very exuberant. He was open, he was frontal, uh, he spoke on a number of platforms and so on. Again, there were three people in the group who used to do the legwork, you know, myself, Kakraba Krumwa to some extent, and Nigel Blankson. Mm -hmm. And if the group had to go to war, you know, we would take the lead and prepare the ground and do all the organizing and get the others to join us later. Kakraba Krumwa, for example, was very instrumental in organizing Kumasi. Mm -hmm. You know, we went ahead as the advance team with Kakrava Cromwell. We stayed in uh, Charles Rekubrobe's family house. You know, Charles Rekubrobe is related to Victor Usu, mm -hmm. the late Victor Usu, and uh, he made his family house available to us. And uh, Kakrava Cromwell was with us. Mm -hmm. There were other people who would, would hardly be mentioned who played a key part. I remember that we went to Kumasi with a gentleman called Charles Baine. Mm -hmm. And Charles Baine came from the Democratic Alliance of Ghana, uh, working mainly in the United States of America and also in London with others. And so on. Charles Baine was with us in Kumasi uh, doing the preparatory work mm -hmm. for the second demonstration which we dubbed Simi Preko and so on. And yeah. there were many people. I mean, uh -huh. Kumasi, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, we had built a group in Kumasi over years. You understand? Who's we? Well, those of us who have been engaged in all kinds of activism. <laughs> and the group in Kumasi had its roots in the movement for freedom and justice, mm -hmm. which was headed by Professor Dubuahini. Mm -hmm. It had its group in the Dan Kwabuzia Club, and it had its roots also in the Popular Party for Democracy and Development. I'm talking about people like uh, Nana Ninsin Mbia, mm -hmm. okay? uh, Nana Kwating, who was the chairman of the PPDD in Kumasi, a guy called Victor Wusu, uh, Kwabneje, who was an old activist of the Convention People's Party. Uh, not the one we know. Not, not the former NDC chairman. No, no, no. He's okay. much younger. Okay. I mean, Kwabneje is an old activist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Bilson. Yeah, Dr. Bilson. Dr. Yes. Bilson was yeah. key, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 the, in the Ashanti region and, and in Kumasi and so on. There were many others, you know, who held the fort in Kumasi, you know, and they did a lot of the work in Kumasi. I mean, Kumasi was the biggest demonstration that we organized. In Accra, it was estimated that we put about 100,000 people on the streets. In Kumasi, the estimate was that we put 500,000 people on the streets of Kumasi. Okay. And, and it was thanks to the work that all of these very different people and so on who have not been recognized, who history may never recognize, who may never be known and so on, who put their shoulders to the wheel and made Kumasi happen. So this was in 1995 and it was one year to the second election under the Fourth Republic, wasn't it? Yeah. So it was a country like today that you, we already get into election mode. Were we in an election mode? There was no private radio, by the way. Yeah, there was no private radio. Joy FM had not started? No, no, there, there, there was no private radio. There was no private radio. Okay, let, let me the, deal the with first, that because the young the people first, want me to ask you that attempt, question. The first attempt at establishing private radio was the attempt which was made by Dr. Charles. Charles yeah. And that was Brothers. after Kumi That was Radio I. Yeah, was it after Kumi Preko? Yes, I think so. It was after Kumi Preko. Okay, so. the young yeah. people are interested in this, so let me ask you that. Mm -hmm. There was no private radio. Yeah. There was no private television. Yeah. There was the state broadcaster, GBC, GBC Radio. Mm -hmm. How did you get your message across to put 100,000 people, which was a CNN estimate, and we quoted that in our promotional video. How did you, what, who were you telling what? You know, you have to think outside the box when you're dealing with extraordinary situations, mm -hmm. okay? So I recall that we had developed some scheme for communication, which was very irregular. Mm -hmm. I recall that in 1992 or thereabout, we got a stacro styling machine. What's that? It's a machine for duplicating... Okay. Material the so. one newspapers you said? No, no, no. Okay. This is the one you do manually. Okay. You know, okay. We used to do it manually mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, 
I think that machine had come from a Kutu Empire. Kutu Empire is the one who managed to arrange that machine. And we couldn't keep it in our houses because we were all under surveillance. You know, it was difficult to meet and so on. So again, it was a Kutu Empire who came up with the brilliant idea that we should plant this machine in the boys' quarters of somebody who was working for government, who was living in a government bungalow. And I will not tell you who that person is. Mm -hmm. OK. But he, that person was with you? Well, he had worked with Akutu Ampao and others in the okay. New Democratic Movement. OK. And so he, he, he was he, a he government was, person? He, he was working in government, okay. but he was sympathetic to our cause. OK. You know. So the machine was kept in his house? So we planted this machine. When you say we planted, do you mean we kept it or you put it in well, the ground? Well, we put it in his, in his boys' quarters. <laughs> OK. So we'll go there at night, you know, and overnight, throughout the night, we'll be printing these documents and so on. And then we found a way, which I'm not going to describe to you because it might be useful again. again. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's going to be useful again. You have mobile phones, you have Facebook, you have WhatsApp. Oh, you you can, never how know. is that going to be useful again? You, you, never, will, you will never need that you again. You never Chrissy. know. You will never need it. In the face of mobile phones and all, mm. there are still underground movements around the world. Okay. So mobile phone does not answer the question. Okay. So you distributed these so somehow? So we we'll find a way of distributing this. And people just collected them and made more copies and so on. Oh, I that see. That method was still available. Ah. And then we would also go to the foreign media and do things which came back to Ghana and got spread. How did they get back to Ghana? Graphic we use it? You know, I recall that the first person to make allegations of extrajudicial killings against the PNDC was me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how did I do it? I went to the UK, I went to London, and granted an interview to the British Broadcasting Corporation. I was interviewed by Robin White at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know. And I made all those allegations and so on on BBC. And it came straight back to Ghana because it was on Focus on Africa, and yeah. everybody was listening to Focus yeah. on Africa yeah. and so on. So the BBC was one of the, of the means of reaching here. We also had somebody who was sympathetic, who was working for the Voice of America. He had worked with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, and I think his name was Robert Cote. Richard Cote. Richard Cote, you're yeah. right. Yeah, you're Richard, right. Cote. Richard Cote. Yeah. And Richard Cote would grant us interviews mm -hmm. and so on. There were still private newspapers. You still had private newspapers. And the Ashanti Pioneer, played a leading role in spreading our message. And then you had the Ghanaian Voice, which was edited by Dan Ansa. Mm -hmm. And I used to work on the Ghanaian Voice with Dan Ansa. So the Ghanaian Voice also became an instrument of propagating our ideas. And, and Do so you have the statesman at that time, 95? Was it I there? think so. I think we had the statesman. Ferdinand mm -hmm. was working for the statesman mm -hmm. and so on. So, the, 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 the print media played a key role in this So, so how did people know they had to be at Kwame Nkrumah Circle at 6 o'clock in the morning? Hold on, yeah. hold on, you know. Now, the other thing we did was to meet people directly. One on one? One on one. And that was a hell of a job. I mean, look, in the evenings, we'll go to three wards, three constituencies, and meet the people face to face and deliver the message. And we did it almost every day. You know, personal direct contact with people was part of the trick. Mm -hmm. And then another part of the trick had to do with the circulation of pamphlets, leaflets, and so on, which were printed in large numbers and just spread them across the country and so on. You understand? Look, mind you, some of us, had worked underground for a period. Yeah. I mean, 1985, 1986, 1987, I was in an underground movement, mm -hmm. you know. So you uh, knew how to get your message across. And I think I can say that I belong to an underground movement whose leader was uh, Yao Opoku. Yao Opoku is a lawyer, mm -hmm. you understand. And we had learned a lot of things and so on. Okay. And, and Sheshe mm -hmm. was, was an expert, you know, in, in doing some of these things and so on. So we managed to get the message across, perhaps even more effectively than we managed to do today with all the proliferation of uh, electronic media and so on. It would appear so. Yeah. So we on the night before the, the May, where were you? Where did you stay before you, you started the day early morning to, to conduct this demonstration? 
If my memory serves me right, that night, that is the 10th of May, 1995, we must have been at the residence of Nana Dudanko Akufuado. Which one? Where, where he Nima, now lives? Nima where residence. he lives now? I don't know where he lives. He, li he lives in Nima. Right. At, at least that's where he gave his president's uh, 2016 acceptance speech. Presidents don't live in one No, no, not, not when he was president-elect. That's where he gave his acceptance speech. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. But so you are referring to the same house? Yeah. I okay. mean, that was my house too. It was oh, really? everybody's house. Everyone was going there? No, it was, it was a house. I mean, we ate there. We did everything there, you know. I see. Yes. So you stayed there the night so, before? No, I didn't stay there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we met there to evaluate what we had done and to anticipate what was likely to happen the next day, which was the D-Day, mm -hmm. and so on. And I recall giving the advice that it was important for all of us to sleep in different places, and preferably not our own homes, and so on. Because we've had the experience before, you know. Um, I won't tell you where I slept. Oh, you could, you can. Twenty-five no, no, years. No, 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 no. Twenty-five years has come and gone. Look, you can tell us the area. We, we don't need to know. No, the no, no. So many people are still alive. Okay. And so on. Okay. Uh, people did things uh, for which they will still feel uncomfortable about talking about and so on. Okay. I don't want to drag people into the fair in, enough, into fair the center. So you place. stayed somewhere, and each of you stayed at different places. Yes. Do you know where Kukubaku yeah. stayed that night? I don't know. Okay. Don't so know. what was the plan for the morning? So in the morning. We gathered at the Nima residence of Nana Akufuado. At what time? Oh, very early in the morning. Six. M must have been at dawn, maybe before six. Okay. You know. And Paul. A lot of people thought that we were grandmasters. You know, we had everything and so on. It wasn't like that. In the morning when we met at Nana Akufuado's house, mm -hmm. We kept asking ourselves whether we're going to be successful or not. Or oh, the morning of the event. The morning of the event. How many people are going to turn up? You didn't know. You had no way to, to be sure. There was so much fear. We had been warned that people were going to be killed and so on. I think I've jumped something. Oh, sorry. Let me come back to that. And uh, viewers, let me do this. Listening to the news as a little boy in those days, there was a lot of encounter between you and the police. The GBC News kept mentioning your names to report to the police headquarters? What was that about? The police and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ACDLs had held a press conference. Yes, and yes, they had yes. warned that if you went on the demonstration, people would die yes, and so yes, on. Yes. So there was a lot of fear mongering. Did you en encounter the police, the, the nine of you, in meetings? Yeah, I think we had had a number of meet meetings with the police and so on. So they said the route because that then became the controversial We issue. agreed on the route. On, you we agreed, agreed with the police on the route. On the route. Yeah. So this was a permitted demonstration, by the way. Of course, we, 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 we went through the, the process, motion yeah, and so on. Yeah. And that was not the first demonstration. We had done many demonstrations yeah. before. Okay. The rules of the game had been established and mm -hmm. so on, and yet we were being threatened yes. and so on. So we are back at Nana Kufado's house, 6 a.m. On, on demonstration day. I think I probably got there before 6 a.m. Okay. You know. And then we all gathered in Nana's house. Did you dress in a particular way? I was in a Kumi Preku t shirt. Everybody well, that's what was people in a had. Okay. t shirt, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I carried a lot of things, you know. Um, because Akotuampa and I were in charge of the security of the whole demonstration. So <laughs> we carried the communication equipment. The communication equipment was carried by me in the front and Akotuampa in the back, you know. The front of the, of the row and the back, all the way. Akotuampa was responsible for the back. But that's a long distance because at some point the front was at Kingsway, the back was still at Kwame Nkrumah Circle. Well, now it's difficult to tell which was the front and which was the back because mm -hmm. at some point the crowd was so huge that you couldn't tell wh which was the front and which was the back. Mm -hmm. But in planning for the demonstration, we had agreed that I would take care of the front and Akutu Empire would take care of the back. And uh, we had a responsibility to ensure that infiltrators did not come in to, to mess the demonstration up and, 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 and so on. Okay. You know, but Nakufado's house, at some point, I think he ran about between 7.30 and 8. You, you guys were still there? You hadn't moved? Yeah. A decision was made that we need to go on a recce to find out what the situation was at the Kwame Nkrumah Circle. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Akutuampa and I 
who volunteered to go on the recce. So we walked from Nanaku Fado's house towards the Kwame Nkrumah circle. But you could be identified. People knew who you were. No, of course, of course. Okay. You always had to take a risk in those days. Mm -hmm. And my goodness, as we approached the Kwame Nkrumah circle, what we saw was shocking. People had mastered. Thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people shouting, singing. I mean, the police could not stop that demonstration. Just multitudes and so on. We were so, so surprised. We didn't think that we would pull that crowd. You know? But that crowd had gathered. Waiting so, for leadership. Yeah. So we quickly rushed back to Nana Kufuado's house and gave a report about what had happened and recommended that we needed to move immediately. Mm. Because if we didn't move immediately to provide leadership to that crowd, God knows what could have happened. That crowd needed to be led, you know, and so on. So we moved in. <clears throat> now we had organized the security so well, you understand? We had people who were going to protect the leaders. We put the leaders in a ring, and there were people who were going to protect the leaders. They formed a ring, we put the leaders in the ring. Mm -hmm. And then there were rows of people in front of the leaders and so on. So the leaders were embedded in the crowd, yeah. you know, in order to ensure that, you know, <clears throat> I was exposed. Mm -hmm. Akutuampa was exposed. So, so if you look at the pictures of the demonstration. If we can get some of the videos of the demonstration, just put it up so we can <coughs> have a feel of 25 years ago. And, mm -hmm. and if you saw pictures of the leaders which were taken and so on, we were not there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you understand? Akutuampa was not there, was not there and so on. So that was the strategy. But we are trained people to help protect the demonstration and uh, to act as, as some kind of security. So when the demonstration <clears throat> ended, or did it end, what happened? You started marching and what happened? The demonstration did not end formally. Mm -hmm. It didn't What end. is this? Oh, this is at the funeral. What were you telling Anako Fado? This is, I think, just before the, the press conference. Yeah. You know, and, and the taking of that photograph, which has become his story. Yeah, yes, but so. what were you discussing here? You well, we, we used to talk about everything and anything, and I mm -hmm. cannot remember exactly what was being discussed. But you can see Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamakro. Yeah. You can see young Nana Adudankwa Akufuado. <laughs> and you can see, I think, Kukubaku in his dark glasses. Yes, in the background. Yeah. yeah and, and some other activists who I say would never be known. And I didn't ask about Dr. Nyaho Tamakro. What was his role? You, you sort of mentioned other people. What was Dr. Nyaho Tamakro's role? Well, Nahu Tamakro was part of the group, very much a part of the group. Mm -hmm. He took part in all the meetings. He took part in all the decisions that were taken. Yeah. Uh, he brought his own expertise in, in security and so on. You know, he was a very key member of the group. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. Wow. So this is Dr. Charles Roku Brobe's house, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did the demonstration end on that day? If we get photos of the demonstration, we'll show it. How did it end on that day? It ended disastrously. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first shots were fired around Farisco. Mm -hmm. That is where Ahunu Honga lost his life. Yes. You know. Um, so this is the, this and, is the and, demonstration. And so is this the front or is this the back? This must be somewhere in the middle. Okay. That is like HIV. That's what somebody... Yeah. So where is it? Hold it here, hold it here, hold it here. What gate is that? I suspect mm -hmm. that this must be around the high street. You know, and this is not the tick of the demonstration. Oh, this is the side issues. Those who broke away on the what side. What had happened was that, what had happened was that um, at Farisco, when the first shooting happened, the demonstrators broke up into all kinds of groups. Mm. There were a group which headed towards Makola, a group took the path to the Trade Union Congress and so mm. on. So the demonstration really didn't come to a formal end. You know, I found my way, you know, to Dr. Brovey's house, you know. And oh, I see. Yeah. So you didn't address the demonstrators? No, no, we couldn't. Ah. There was total mayhem. When the shooting came in. Exactly. So we all regrouped in the house of Dr. Charles Reku Brovey, Northridge, to evaluate what had happened. We took reports of what had happened, and uh, we decided the next line of action, you know, 
It was then that we decided to identify all the people who have been injured, those who have died, those who are still in hospital, and then decided to visit them and, and, and so on, you understand. And um, we started discussing the next line of action. And Paul, it, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After the first demonstration in Accra, yeah. there were suggestions by some of us that we needed to continue the demonstrations. We needed to take the demonstration to Kumasi. Mm -hmm. And there were others who said no. They didn't want to risk any more lives. They were, they were so passionate that there should be no reason why anybody should die. Mm -hmm. That they didn't want to risk any more lives. So the Accra one was enough. How many had died in Accra? I think four. Mm. You know. That's significant. Yeah. And then there was another group of people who said that, look, Accra has been so hugely successful and that if we did another demonstration somewhere else and we did not attract the same crowd and so on, it would be an anticlimax. Yes, yes, that's true. And uh, it would take from the impact of what we had done in Accra. And there's a small group of the core members who said, no way, we are continuing this to the end. You understand? Until the demands are met, we needed to continue what we had started. I think we had a long, long, long debate about this. This debate must have lasted for about three days or a week. You wow. know, and In meetings upon meetings? Meetings upon meetings. What do we do after Kumi Preku? So eventually, if my memory serves me right, and I've already told you that it's a long time ago. No one person knows everything. Yeah. You understand? So eventually, I think what happened was that those who insisted on carrying on then said, okay, if you don't want to come along, stay away. We are going ahead. Oh, I see. Yes. And then everybody came on board, and uh, Kumasi happened. And after Kumasi, my goodness, the enthusiasm was so huge, we went everywhere who went to all the regional capitals, you know. And Tamale was, was quite significant. You know, Tamale is not as who big. Who was bankrolling all that? Who was paying for this? That is an interesting question. Hmm. I mean, in today's politics, everything must be paid for. Mm -hmm. Okay? Everything is paid for. Even by 1995, we did a lot of things on the basis of the commitment of individuals. People were not asking to be paid to do anything. Mm. It was passion for what we were doing. It was commitment. It was the realization that you know, we had to shape national destiny to some extent and so on. You understand? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't money. I mean, today I know that the political parties, when they are organizing demonstrations and so on, they have to put in a lot of resources. And so on. It wasn't like that in the 1980s and early 1990s, you know. Of course, you needed money to buy placards, yeah. you know, to buy ink to write the slogans and so on. But that was not the kind of huge money that, you know, we tend to spend on our politics today. And that kind of money came from well-wishers, you know, came from the activists themselves. I guess that somebody like Dr. Charles Roku probably put in a fortune. You know, I guess he put in a fortune. Dr. Charles Roku probably was an energy policy advisor. Mm -hmm. You know, I suspect from the UNDP, seconded to the government and so on. And uh, his remuneration was quite impressive then, mm -hmm. you know. And he spent a lot of his own personal resources on this. All of us became fundraisers, mm -hmm. and we raised a bit of funds, and so on. Two days ago, incidentally two days ago, there's a friend of mine whose name I would never mention. Mm -hmm. Even if you put a gun to my head, I won't mention his name. Who sent me a message, I hope he's not watching me tonight, but uh, he sent me a message and said, oh, you guys celebrated this event without inviting people like us who helped with, with some 
resources and so on. So I called him back and I said, I never knew that you put in a penny. Oh, I see. I didn't know. But he was speaking the truth. I've checked, eventually checked, and found out that this friend of mine, this very, very good friend of mine, contributed to the kitty. You understand? So it, it was all like that. You know, I mean, civil okay. servants. Two more questions. Contributing their to the widow's might and, and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, so there was some discussions that we had as, as small boys that the Alliance for Change in 1996, Alliance had become very popular after the demonstrations and was almost bigger than the existing opposition political parties. There was then a very big conversation that should Alliance become a political party because you had managed to get an amalgamation of people from different CPP, UP, and it was feared by the government because of what you had carried out in the demonstrations that the Alliance should become a political party or the Alliance should back a certain political candidate. And the, the discussions and the conversations and the tensions that it brought up resulted in the defeat of the opposition in 1996 election because from what you guys did by 1995, J.J. Rollins was gone. But you couldn't consolidate what the Alliance did and that's what occasioned Mr. Rollins' uh, victory in 1996. And so for some of you, the Alliance leaders who saw what had happened, you were certain that the 2000 election will be won by the opposition. What is the truth in this alliance becoming? I'm sure this is the first time you're speaking about it, and we are grateful that you are speaking about it on our platform. Well, there is some truth in it, and only some truth in it. Mm -hmm. That agitation had, quite, had actually begun before the Alliance for Change was established. Mm -hmm. Okay. I recall that when we formed the Movement for Freedom and Justice, at some point, at a meeting in the house of Professor Albert Edubuahini, who was the national chairman of the Movement for Freedom and Justice, he came up with a suggestion that we should turn the movement into a political party. And there was a lot of pressure on us to transform the Movement for Freedom and Justice into a political party which united the opposition against government. Mm -hmm. And we could not reach agreement on that. I mean, I opposed it. I vehemently opposed it, you know, and said, look, I'm an incrumized. No matter what happens, I'm an incrumized. And uh, we are fighting for pluralism. We are fighting for free expression and so on. You cannot have free expression and pluralism and so on if all of us are headed into one political movement. You know, and there are many others who opposed that idea at the so time. So about the AFC, what happened? Now, that same pressure came up again when we formed the Alliance for Change. There were many, many, many people who came to us and said we should transform the Alliance for Change into a political party, but we resisted it. You know, we decided not to form a political party, not to transform the Alliance for Change into a political party. As a matter of fact, at some stage, we even decided, in the initial stages, we decided that none of us was going to contest for the presidency or for, for, for office in the political parties. So we, we took that decision, firm decision. And then we also decided not to support any of the presidential aspirants. So we saw our role as just carrying on the agitation to free space, you know, for, for, for everybody and not to put ourselves, you know, in power or to use that as a process for, for grabbing political power, you understand? Now, some interesting things happened. And I don't know, you know. One, one of the biggest opposition to the Alliance for Change came from the New Patriotic Party. I don't understand that. You wouldn't. That, that, that came from them how? Yeah. Because they are Nana Kufuado, they are Charles Rekubrobe, they are Victor Newman, were part of the Alliance for yeah, Change. Yeah, you wouldn't understand. Let me explain it to you. Okay. The Alliance for Change had become so big, so influential, and so on. Mm -hmm. And there were fears from the established political parties 
that if we transformed into a political party, it would affect their fortune. You will, over, you will overrun them completely. Exactly. So yeah. that fear was there. Yeah. It's a genuine okay. fear. Yeah. There was also the fear that having galvanized these millions, you know, across the country and so on, uh, leaders of the Alliance for Change had become so strong, so influential, so powerful. Very popular. That they could get into the political parties and take over the leadership of the political parties. And win. Yes. Yeah. So, from the New Patriotic Party, a newspaper was established. It was called The New Era. Mm -hmm. You should check on that. Mm -hmm. And the sole purpose of The New Era was to fight the Alliance for Change. You know. So, the Rawlings regime was fighting us all right. But amongst us, in the opposition, there were forces which were also fighting against us. Every publication of The New Era was directed not at the Rawlings regime, but at the Alliance for Change. We were called all kinds of names. We were called usurpers and so on. Including their own people, the MPP's people that have named Anako Fuadu. Anako Fuadu yes. was seen then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, was seen then as a rival, as a threat to some entrenched forces within the new patriotic party. You are referring then straight away to the JQ4 people? No. Because Professor Dubois had, uh, was exiting at that time. No. And the new leadership... As a matter of fact, the new era... Mm -hmm. was established by Professor Dubuahini. It was printed from Professor Dubuahini's house. But in 1995, Dubuahini was, was, was exiting, hmm. wasn't he? Take it from me. Okay. The new era was sponsored Yeah, I get that. I get that. So, so, so maybe Professor Dubuahini might have felt that having led the um, uh, culture of silence, breaking the culture of silence, and having led that movement, Maybe he probably felt, I mean, in, in pure political science analysis, he probably felt that he, his place had been taken by other people. Look, so what, that it was not a policy of the new patriotic party. It was a sort of uh, territorialism by, if by, you by, put, if you want to by the, by the way, history professor. If you want to put it that way, I'm not going to object to that, mm -hmm. you know. But you need to understand something. Both Professor Edubu Ahili and Nana Akufuado, hmm, had been active in the People's Movement for Freedom and Justice, which was led by Kovna Gbelegwedema and General Afrifa. But that was 20 years earlier. That was 1979, thereabout. Yeah, oh, yeah, about 17, 78, 79, 17 years you know, earlier. Okay. Thereabout, mm -hmm. you know. And indeed, Nana Kufuadu had become the national secretary of, of the, the People's Movement for Freedom and Justice. But Dr. Badamo Asamoah says they were joint secretaries. He and Anaku Fado were joined. But Anaku Fado was secretary. Yes, you know, okay. okay. Yes. Be that as it may. Mm -hmm. And then, when the ban on party political activities was lifted, Anaku Fado was very, very, very close to Professor Dubois. Yes. I mean, he was so close. He actively supported Professor Dubois. Mm -hmm. But when Kumi Preku came, when the Alliance for Change came, even his friends began to see him as a threat. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us were seen as threats and so on. And that led to that battle which was waged against us from some quarters within the new patriotic party. That's interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting bit of history that we have to document and study. Mm -hmm. Michael Kui has not written about that yet. Okay, another Michael question. Michael was not involved in this struggle. Yeah, yeah I know that. I know that. He, he was not involved in this. I mean, you want to, I, I can say uh, that Michael emphatically. Was he was not involved okay. in these struggles. Another matter is that what was the relationship between this alliance going forward? Was there a sort of leadership frosty relationship between Charles Rekobrobe and Nana Kufado in the alliance for change? Look, I wouldn't put it that way. For every movement, for every aggregation of human beings and so on, their tensions, their frictions, their misunderstandings and so on, especially for a broad national alliance such as the Alliance for Change. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I considered myself as an unrepentant Nkrumahist. Mm -hmm. You understand? And there were people in the group who also possibly consider themselves as unrepentant, Dankwa, Buziais, and so on. So we always had to make concessions. We always had yeah. to, and, and, and so on, you know. Um, so there were tensions right from day one. You know, eventually the Alliance for Change split up into two groups. 
who led both groups? Well, I think that the principle of collective leadership continued to, to, to guide our activities even when the breakup came. And uh, when we broke up, some of us, uh, maybe I shouldn't even mention the names and so on, but some of us actually broke away. I mean, Weku probably was prominent in the group which broke yeah, away and yeah. so on. And uh, they claimed that they were the real alliance for change. Mm -hmm. And uh, our group, which included the Naku Fuadu, also claimed that it was a real alliance for change. Now, we did some things, you know. We immediately decided now to recruit others to join us, you know. So it was at that point that Stanley A. J. Blankson, in whose house all of this started, joined us in the core. Joined your side? In the core. Okay. You know, became a full member of the core. Mm -hmm. It was at this stage also that Hawaii Akubu well, that's interesting. was brought in into the core. Mm -hmm. Hawaii Akubu was brought into the core, the late Hawaii Akubu. Mm -hmm. Who was an independent member of parliament. Who was an independent mm -hmm. member of parliament, mm -hmm. but came into the core. Very popular, articulate woman came into the core. Mm -hmm. And then I think Achulowo, mm -hmm. Achulowo, mm -hmm. another member of parliament, another member of parliament also joined us. I think so. I think Achulowo also joined us and became part of the core. You understand? So all of these development happened. But Paul, I would not hold what happened against anybody. You understand? Mm -hmm. I would not hold it against anybody. These are, these are the way things ought to be. Look, we are not cattle. We are human beings. We can always not be headed in one direction. People have a right to disagree. People have preferences and so on. That is what we fought for. We fought for difference. You understand? We fought so that people could express different views. We fought and made sacrifices to build a society in which people with different views were not considered as, 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 as enemies and so on. That's what we sought to build. So if amongst ourselves we could not countenance difference and so on, that would have been terrible. Who organized the meeting that celebrated uh, last week, 25 years ago, was it this week, that that's had you and the <coughs> president and Kukubako and others together? I'm not sure. How did you get invited? Well, I got invited by Stanley J. Blankson. Uh, who called me to his house and we had conversations and uh, he indicated to me that it would be a good idea to do something like that. First of all, I skipped one point. Yeah. On the day, May 11th, mm -hmm. I called Stanley J. Blankson and you know, reminded him that that was the anniversary. I said, oh, is that true? And so on. Apparently he had forgotten. Mm -hmm. So he then insisted that I come to his house. And I, I went to his house, we had a conversation, and uh, he indicated that he was going to put together something like this and asked me if I thought it was a good idea. And I said, yes, it would be a good idea. Subsequently, I had a, a phone call. I had a text message and a phone call from Victor Newman, uh, who indicated that something like this was going to happen. And I called uh, Kukubaku. Oh, you called Kukubaku? I called Kukubaku and, and told him that, yeah, this is what I'm hearing and so on. And he felt that it was a good idea. I've seen some publications making heavy weather about the fact that some people were not present and so on. I was going to ask you about Nahota yeah. Maklo, for instance. Yeah. I recall that when I called Kukubaku, he asked me who and who were going to be there. And I said, I didn't know. And he said, it was important for all of us to be there, for mm -hmm. everybody to be there, mm -hmm. you understand? And I agreed with him. Mm -hmm. And I told him to get in touch with, uh, with a Jill Blankson and to make that point and so on. On the day of the dinner, I noticed that some people were not there. And I asked specifically about Dr. Charles Rekubrobi. And I was informed that he's not been feeling very well now and that uh, he's not able to drive at night and he didn't have a driver and i said look somebody should have told me i would have driven to his house and picked him up yeah. and picked him up you know or we could have arranged for an uber or something to bring him and so on it was too late mm -hmm. <clears throat> i think we also asked about uh, dr nyaho nyaho tamaklo and somehow he had not been rich you know he was not rich um 
So we agreed that it was necessary for us to meet again with Dr. Jaho Tamakro. All of us agreed, including the president, mm -hmm. agreed that it was important to gather again uh, with Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamakro. Because you can't take Dr. Nyaho Tamakro out of the group. So this, this meeting was, was there. Why did you hold one? this meeting, the one that the photographs came out? Where did you hold it? I see your, your promo said that it was in the Flagstaff House. Yes. It was not in the Flagstaff ah, House. Okay. It was in a private residence. Okay. You know, okay. Private residence. So what did you people talk about? What did the president say? Paul. Yes. What do you think of me? No, I'm, I, those that you can tell us. Yeah, of course, the one you can tell us. Throughout this conversation, you have agreed not to tell us some things. We, we I mean, people that. invite you to a private dinner, and then you come and sit on television and be talking about what people said. <laughs> okay, no problem. I people, think you must have a very low opinion of me. No, 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 so, sorry. Not, 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 nothing in that <laughs> regard. You, know. <clears throat> you said you called Kukubaku, and that would surprise some people because there's general feeling that yourself and Kukubaku are not as good as you used to be. What's Who the told you that? I said there's general feeling. Where did you get that feeling from? That people, people feel that. Which way. people? What was the fact? Which um, people? What's the fact, Chris? Because you said you called him, and I'm sure many will be delighted to hear that you said you called him and spoke to him. What's the, what's the general? You're talking about people thinking or saying that yeah. there, there's... Which people? So there's no problem. I've never had a problem with anybody. But is your relationship with Kweku Bako as it used to be from the 70s, 80s, We used 90s? to sleep in the same room. We no longer sleep in the same room. I'm married. I have children. He's I married have a wife. He's, He's married. married. He has children. Yeah. We cannot be sleeping in the same room. Is that a problem for you? Do you, you? visit him as regularly as you were seen together all the time in those days? Paul. Yes, sir. Do you visit all the people you have known in your life? No, not anymore. I don't have time. The people you used to visit... 20 years ago, do you visit them still? Some of them, not all of them. So why are you asking this question? Because I want to know whether you You think still... that we, we are not human? No, I want, to, human. I want to know whether you still have the same relationship with him. Well, I don't have any problem with him. Okay. I don't have any problem with him. Are you concerned that Dr. Nahid I, I, to... I disagree with him on some issues. Okay. And, and it's obvious. Everybody who listens to me knows that I disagree with yeah, him. I think not just clear. him. Yeah, that's clear. I, mean, I disagree with the president sometimes. Yes, yes. You understand? The fact that you called him is, is good enough. Yeah. Are you... Sometimes I disagree with you. In fact, most times I disagree with you. Does that mean that I hate you? In fact, all the time you disagree with me. <laughs> One more question. Are you also concerned about the fact that Dr. Nyahota Maklo has made himself out as a major critic of Akufuado. I go to Dr. Nahota Maklo's house because I like to listen to him. And he's a big brain and he has a lot of experience and expertise. And I like, I like his house. So I, li I like to go there to listen to him. Uh, but he's been a major critic of Akufuado. And for those of you who work together closely, does it unnerve you one way or the other? Why should it? Doctor that a former uh, close associate, mm -hmm. same political party, mm -hmm. run campaigns together. Mm -hmm. uh, and Anaku Fado becomes a presidential candidate in mm -hmm. 2016. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Tamaklo is, is, is dead on against Anaku mm -hmm. Fado's candidature. And Anaku Fado becomes president and he's, he's big against Anaku Fado's candidature. Paul, why don't you look at the flip side? Mm -hmm. Under the leadership of Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, Dr. Nyahota Makro, founding member of the New Patriotic Party, close friend of Nana Akufuado and so on, has been suspended from the party. Have you looked at that side too? I thought you had been recalled. When? Mm. So, there are two sides to mm. everything. Yeah. Besides, Dr. Nyaho Nyahota Makro is not a small boy. No, at all. Of course not. You know. He's a person who has demonstrated over the years that he cares about this country as much as I do and as much as you do and so on. He's entitled to have a different point of view. Mm -hmm. He's entitled to criticize anybody he wants to criticize for as long as he's not engaged in sedition. Mm -hmm. You understand? For as long as he's not committing a criminal act. Why did we fight? Why did we suffer all the indignities that we suffered? I saw your promotional video. Yeah. There was one part of it that I was speaking and so on. You know where I was speaking? Public tribunal. Public tribunal. Many people have asked me that. Many, many people have asked me that. I was speaking at the public tribunal. You were on trial with Professor Dubois. I Dubuahini. was on trial. Mm, with Professor Dubois. Exactly. I was mm. on trial with Professor Dubois. Mm. You understand? Mm. I went on trial at the public tribunal could have faced all the consequences that people who went to the public tribunal faced and so on. And what was it about? 
It was so that we can be different, so that we can speak our mind. It was so that I can disagree even with my friends. I have to say to Sipa, that you are very, very brave. Because when I got that video, and I got it from GBC, I was trying to gather material for my films on history of Ghana, and I saw that. That day, you could have been killed. And no one would have known. No one would have cared. You were very brave. And I've always been looking for the opportunity to congratulate you for that. You were speaking to the public tribunal. That had all the powers in the world. And you were accusing them of bias. Even Professor Dubuahe couldn't do that because I heard his speech too. And he was measured. But you could have been killed that day. You know? Yeah. This was 1980 something. This was 1993. I 93. Think. 93. Okay. Before Kumi Preku. Yes. Understand. And I'll tell you a few things. Mm. I went, I was arrested, you know. And Professor Dubuahe was arrested. He was teaching in Legon when he was arrested. So we all ended up at the police headquarters. And from the police headquarters, they took us to the National Public Tribunal. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, Professor Dubuani had a team of lawyers. Yes, I saw that in the videos. Yes. I decided to defend myself. Yeah, I yes, decided they, they said that, that I was too. not going to have any lawyer. Mm. And I made that decision because I'd come to the conclusion that what was happening in the tribunal was political. It was not legal. Mm. And if it was political, nobody could defend me better than I could defend myself. Indeed, President Kufo, uh, he was in the video. President he was Kufour, there. Yes, I saw him in the video. Former President Kufo offered to be my lawyer, and I said, "Well, far no, I will defend myself." He then said, "If you don't want me as your lawyer, I would be your legal advisor." So if you look at my trial, President Kufo was sitting right behind me. I saw that. Me. I'll show that video to viewers next week. I'll show you know, it. Yeah. Pre uh, 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 President Kufo was sitting right behind me, mm. you know. But, hey, you know. Was it, was it bravery or story. was it bravery or it was just indiscretion? When you look at that today. Well, I, you, don't, I don't know what it was. Would you do the same thing? Would you risk your life? Because this guy could have said, look, take this guy and go and execute him. Just, just throw him somewhere. Well, I don't know what I would do today. There were no cameras. There was no general public. The, the material that I'm looking at today has been made available by GBC years after it happened. It wasn't made available then. You know, I don't know what I would do today. And in those days, I didn't set out to do the things that I did, mm -hmm. you know. Um, one aspect of that trial, which still, you know, we were granted bail. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten what the amount was and so on. So we're taking it to the registry. And then Auntie Mary and so on, they came together, brought deeds of properties. And then Professor Dubuaini had fulfilled his bail conditions and was sitting there. And they were leaving. And Auntie Mary turned to me and said, but what are you doing? Are you not going? I said, look, I don't have any property. <laughs> you understand? I don't have anything to guarantee my bail. So we'll meet at the next court date the next tribunal date. And then Auntie Mary turned to Professor Dubois and said, Edu, you can't leave Kwesi here. If you leave Kwesi here, you are finished. You know. So they came back. They went and organized some deeds, some properties, and so on. I had no hand in it. And they used their properties to secure my bail. So I walk out of the tribunal building. Professor Dubois gets into his car. I think there was a three or four car convoy, and he's driven away. Now, I get out. I didn't have a car. I had a car. I had a car then. I bought a Fiat 127 from Ben Epson, but it wasn't available. Oh, you bought it from Ben Epson? Yeah, I, bought my, I bought that <laughs> car from Ben Epson, a Fiat Good evening to you, Big Ben. You know. <laughs> but I didn't have the car with me then. Mm -hmm. you know. So I came out, and I was going to look for a taxi you know, to go wherever I had to go. And so Were you married? I was married. I had children. I had... I guess I had all my children by then. And How so. did you explain these uh, behaviors to your family? Don't worry. Forget about that. You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but then, Paul. Yeah. So I came out. And by the time I realized, I was flying on the shoulders of a multitude. Oh, they lifted you up. And they carried me from... Parliament House today, yes, yes, which was then the, the, the public, tribunal. public tribunal, so where Shraj sits, yeah, yeah, and carried me all the way to the NPP headquarters. The crowd, you know, 
But at that time, Professor Dubu Ahine and his wife and so on had gone into their car and had gone home. They didn't go to the MPP headquarters? No. Okay. So the crowd carried me to the MPP headquarters and I was about to address the crowd when some of the MPP leaders came and said, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to wait for Professor Dubu Ahine. So they brought Professor Dubu Ahine to join me in addressing the crowd. You know. Wow. But this is history. I mean, this is a lot of history. This is a lot of history. history yeah. So, the final question we ran out of time. The conditions that made all of you do Kumi Prekum, are they present in Ghana today? Is Ghana better? Would we have no basis to organize a Kumi Prekum? Or would we have basis to organize a Kumi Prekum, in which case we would have failed as a nation? I suspect that this is a trick question. But I'll deal with it. Mm. You understand? Mm -hmm. The conditions of neocolonialism, mm -hmm. the conditions in which we do not control our resources and our resources are not exploited for the benefit of our people, the conditions in which we are not masters of our own destiny, the conditions in which foreign powers, to a very large extent, dictate who we are and what we will become, are still present today. Our new colonial status has not changed one bit. Mm. And all the things that we suffer, the unemployment, mm, the low wages, frequent increases in prices of petroleum products and so on, the fact that we are getting less than 3% of the total revenue that comes from our gold and so on, all of these conditions are conditions of underdevelopment imposed on us by the colonial structure of our economy and so on. We cannot get out of this unless and until we make a conscious effort to break the chains of colonialism. Mm. That's the only way. You understand? That's the only way. We struggled against the introduction of VAT. We struggled against high cost of living and so on. Huh? We were struggling against symptoms of the problem. I would admit. Mm -hmm. We struggled against symptoms of the problem. The real problem of underdevelopment and poverty and so on are the direct result of the maintenance of the colonial structure of our economy, the maintenance of, of colonial politics and so on. It is not yet Uhuru in Ghana mm -hmm. and not yet Uhuru in many, many of the African states, if not all of the African states. So a Ghana beyond aid. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, I don't have much time. Let's leave it here. Oh, tell me what that means. <laughs> that was what Akufado said in his first sessional address. So what does that mean? A Ghana beyond aid. What does it mean? Ghana in beyond aid. In real concrete terms, what does that mean? I I'll leave it here, Chrissy, but congratulations to all of you who have uh, blazed the trail this way. God bless all of you, the leaders and the participants of that famous Kumi Preko March, and also uh, the government of the, uh, of the uh, NDC who agreed to call down the VAT at that time. Dr. Chrissy Butcher and others. But Ghana has had such great history with such great political competition. Even then, and one thing that worries me all the time is when I hear the political insults today. Because when I started this journey, there were no insults among politicians. It was just a competition of ideas. Even Kumi Preku that you talk about, uh, the shooting was, was, was the first that people really complained about. One of the things that gave ETMS a bad name in those days was about that. But you guys conducted your politics with such candor and there was not insults across the table. Today we have a lot of that and hopefully we'll get and, over and that And that again. is why, Paul, mm. that is why mm, all of us must make a clear, genuine commitment to ensuring that what happened at Ayawasu West Wagon mm -hmm. doesn't happen, happen again. Ever again. Ever That's again. a serious blot mm. on our record. Mm. You understand? Yeah. We could not have, have been abhorred by the Kumi Preku killings mm -hmm. and uphold what happened at Ayawasu West, West Wagon. That's, that's a matter of fact. That's a matter of fact.